Hey guys, Miss Miklos here, and this is the chapter one review video. So I'm just gonna go through a few concepts that I just really want to stress that um, you know for your test. If you guys look at the review worksheet, um, unlike previous courses, the test is not always an exact replica of the review sheet, but it does give you a good example of the types of problems that you want to make sure to study. So today I want to start by talking about properties and um, I would definitely advise looking back through your previous quizzes. We did a lot of these problems on quiz one and quiz two, but there's two major things that I want to highlight. The first thing I want to highlight is that you need to be specific. So what I mean by that is we definitely need to say if it is a property of multiplication or of addition. Remember that the distributive property deals with both, so we wouldn't need to do that. The second thing I want to highlight is the difference between the identity versus an inverse. An identity gets us back to the original number. For example, 5 times 1 equals 5. 5 was our original number, so we would say 1 is the multiplicative identity. Remember that 0 is the additive identity, or we could say identity property of addition. What the inverse does is get us back to the identity. For example, 5 times 1 fifth equals 1. We said over here 1 was the identity, so here I'm multiplying by something to get me back to the identity. In addition, that would be like adding the opposite value of something. Next, I want to take a look at some Martian math. So I went ahead and drew a chart. Remember on our test, charts like this will be given already. I would expect to see more than one of these. And there are really four different questions that are going to be asked. The first is, is this closed? And remember, closure means that whenever I do an operation, I'm always going to get one of these elements back as my answer. So the output is going to be a member of the original set. So if we look at this particular problem, everything in here are the outputs. And I notice that we have these numbers that are not a member of our original set. So we would say, no, it is not closed. The next question would be, is this commutative? And just to review what commutative means, that means if I drew a line straight down the diagonal, would there be a reflection? Would there be a mirror image if I fold it on that line? So if you drew that line, we would notice 5 and 5 match up, 4 and 4, 3 and 3, 3 and 3, 2 and 2, 1 and 1. So everything is an exact reflection. So we would say, yes, it is commutative. The third question would be, does each element or does star have an identity? Now just to review, we said an identity gets us back the original element. So I'm going to go ahead and look at this column and I need to look and see is there another column that looks identical to it. And yes, this very first column is a complete match. So what I'm going to look at, if I star 0, okay 0 is what is connected to this column. So that means that whenever I star 0, I get my original element back. So we would say, yes, there is an identity, and it is 0. Okay, this is really important. I would definitely expect to see a few of these questions on our test. The final question is, is there an inverse for each element? First of all, we talked about this in class when we learned this section. But if there's not an identity, so if we said no here, there's no way there could be an inverse because the whole purpose of an inverse is getting us back to the identity. In this case, we said that the identity is zero. So I need to look in each column, do I have a zero? Yes. The second column, no. So I can stop there and say no, there is not an inverse for this particular set. Now I want to look at our favorite we like to call them star, but I'm using a different symbol here just to show us. It's just a symbol that we don't know. So there would be four different questions that you guys would need to answer about a problem like this. The first would be something like two circle plus three. 
The first thing we need to figure out is what are we substituting in for x, what are we substituting in for y. So since 2 is in front of circle plus, that's what I'm putting in for x. 3 is behind circle plus, so that's what I'm putting in for y. So I get 3 times the quantity 2 plus 3, which is 3 times 5, which is 15. So our final answer here would be 15. The second question is, is this closed under natural numbers? So we need to remember natural numbers means all of our counting numbers. If I substitute any two counting numbers into that original equation, will the output always be a counting number? And if we look here, I have addition and I have multiplication. If I add any two counting numbers, I will always get a counting number back. If I multiply a counting number by 3, I will always get a counting number back. If I had seen subtraction or division, I would have said no here, but my answer this time is going to be yes. Now let's get to the fun ones. Is circle plus commutative? We know commutative means the order changes, so I'm going to start by using a generic or general proof using variables. I'm going to use a and b, so I'm saying a circle plus b equals b circle plus a. I'm just going to focus on the left side. I need to figure out what am I substituting in for x, what am I substituting in for y. It looks like x would be our a value because both of those are before the circle plus, and y would be our b value because both of those are behind the circle plus. When I substitute those in, I get 3 times the quantity a plus b. When I distribute, I get 3a plus 3b. Notice that my star operation is gone, and I'm only left with values here that we know how to work with. Now we're going to look at the right side, this b star a. I need to figure out what are we substituting in for x, what are we substituting in for y. This time, our x value is going to be b because those are in front of this circle plus. And our y value is going to be a because those are both after circle plus. So when I substitute those in, I get 3 times the quantity b plus a. Notice I'm done with circle plus, so now I can just focus on distributing because we know how to deal with multiplication and addition. I get 3b plus 3a, and this is true, so we're going to say yes, it is commutative. Lastly, we're going to deal with associative. We know the associative property deals with groups, so that means we need three variables this time. So I'm using a, b, and c, and if you notice, my order here stays the same. The only thing that changed is what is inside the groups. So I'm going to start on the left side here, and I'm going to focus on the parentheses and do a circle plus b. In that problem, x would be represented by a because those are in front of circle plus, y would be represented by b because that's after circle plus. So I would get 3 times the quantity a plus b circle plus c. We could just leave it like this or we could go ahead and distribute that 3 if it makes it easier for you. So I have 3a plus 3b circle plus c. Now I know I'm not done because I solved this circle plus so I need to think again what represents x, what represents y. This time, this entire expression 3a plus 3b is in front of circle plus, so that's what x is, and c is after circle plus, so that's what y is. So when I substitute that in, I get something like this, where now I know I don't have any circle pluses left, and I can just distribute the 3 out. So I have 9a plus 9b plus 3c. Now we're moving to the right side. I need to start in the parentheses and figure out what is x and what is y. And since the b is in front of circle plus, that's what I'm putting for x, and c is after circle plus, so that's what I'm putting in for y. Notice I did not do anything with that first a circle plus. So I went ahead and wrote this both ways. I would get 3 times the quantity b plus c, or I could distribute it out. I'm not done because I still have this circle plus left, so I need to figure out what is x, what is y. And if we look at this, this would be our x value because it's in front of circle plus, and this entire expression is y because it's after circle plus. So I have 3 times whatever x is plus whatever y is, so now I need to go ahead and distribute. 
and I get 3a plus 9b plus 9c. Those two expressions are not equal to each other, so we would go ahead and say no. Next concept that we learned about is evaluating and simplifying expressions, and there is a key word I want to remind you guys about, and that is PEMDAS. PEMDAS, just to review, means parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division, addition and subtraction. Multiplication and division are the same steps, so we work from left to right. Same with addition and subtraction. I'm only going to go through one problem on this, and I actually chose a problem that was on one of your quizzes. If I haven't said this already, study your quizzes. Okay, we have the quantity 7 plus y is divided by 10x, and they're telling us what to substitute in for x and y. Whenever I'm substituting in, I'm going to put that value in parentheses. So I have the quantity 7 plus 1 seventh divided by 10 times the quantity 2 sevenths. Just a reminder, if I'm doing fractions in my calculator, I'm using the division sign. I'm using parentheses around it. According to PEMDAS, I need to do my parentheses first. Now, some of you might think, oh, these are parentheses, but can I do anything inside of there? No. Here, I can actually do something. So when I combine those, I get 50 over 7 divided by 10 minus 2 seventh. Now, the trick to this is division and multiplication are the same steps, so I need to work from left to right. So in order to divide by 10, that's like multiplying by 1 tenth. So I have 50 over 7 times 1 over 10 times 2 over 7. Now I can just go ahead and multiply straight across, and I'm going to cancel some stuff out. The 50 and the 10 reduce to be 5 over 1, so now when I multiply straight across, I get 10 over 49. Just a reminder, we should always be giving exact answers. So this is a great example. I'm not going to put that as a decimal and round it. I'm just going to leave it as 10 over 49. Moving on to equations, um, I actually chose another one that was off of your quiz. This is the quiz 1.3. So if we look at this particular problem, um, the reason why I like this one is because we have to deal with distributing a negative. So the first thing I'm going to do on both sides is distribute. So when I do that, I get 10 minus 5 halves x equals 4 minus 1 fourth x plus 1. Now I'm going to combine my like terms on both sides. So when I add together the 4 and the 1, I get 5. I want to get all my like terms together, so I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides. So I get 5 minus 5 halves x equals negative 1 fourth x. Now I need to go ahead and get rid of this and move it on to the other side. So I'm going to add 5 halves to both sides. Um, we can do this in our head by using a common denominator. So the common denominator would be 4, so this would become negative 1 fourth x plus 10 fourths x, which I would end up getting 5 equals 9 fourths x. x is still not all by itself. I need to somehow get rid of this 9 fourths, and I know I can get rid of a coefficient by multiplying by the reciprocal of it. I'm multiplying both sides by 4 over 9, so I get 20 over 9 is equal to x. Now, on your homework, you probably didn't check anything, but on a test, after I finish, I would definitely want to go back and check my work. I know this is true when I substitute 20 over 9 in for these x's, if this is a true statement. One more solving problem I want to go through, and I wanted to go through this just because it's kind of a weird one. Um, first thing I would do is distribute 3. So I get 3x minus 2 equals 3x minus 3, and something strange happens. When I subtract 3x from both sides, I am just left with negative 2 equals negative 3. And back in our notes, we talked about what to do if our variables cancel. We said we need to ask ourselves, is this a true statement? If we say yes, it is, then our answer is all real numbers because no matter what I substitute in, it will make it a true statement. If we say no, it's not true, then our answer is no solution because nothing that I substitute in would ever work. So is negative 2 equal to negative 3? We all know the answer there is no. 
So my answer for this specific question would be no solution. Isolating variables is the next topic I want to discuss, and this is actually off of our quiz as well. This is off quiz number three, and for some reason we try and make this way more difficult than we need to. And I think part of it is it's so ingrained in us to distribute right away. And if you do that, you're not wrong. However, if I want to get A all by itself, why am I going to add a coefficient? I'm going to start by getting rid of the 5 sevenths, which would be by multiplying both sides by 7 over 5. When I do that, I'm left with 7 fifths B equals A minus 12. Now all I need to do is add 12 to get A all by itself, and this would be my final answer. Now if you went ahead and distributed, you're not wrong. You just would need to do a little bit more work to get A all by itself. This is hands down the easiest way to do it. Here comes the tricky isolating problem, and some of you even talked to me about this on your quiz today, because it's, or when we took quiz 1.3. It says solve for Q, and I have P squared Q and 3Q. We have a problem. I have two different Qs. I cannot combine these because they're not like terms. So what do we need to do? And the answer is we need to factor out the GCF. So I took a Q from both of these. So I need to figure out what am I left with. When I take a Q out of P squared Q, I am left with P squared. And when I take a Q out of negative 3Q, I'm left with negative 3. So now I have Q all by itself, or I have it as a single Q, I should say, but it's not all by itself yet. I need to get rid of this. Now I know these two things are being multiplied together. We undo multiplication with division. So when I divide both sides, I end up getting Q equals 14 over P squared minus 3, and this would be our final answer. We're almost done. Now we're going to talk a little bit about inequalities. And I specifically want to go through some or and and problems just to clarify the difference. If I start with an or problem here, these are two different problems on the same number line. So I'm going to draw that number line. And I have negative 3 and 2 written down. So I'm going to do these one at a time. Okay, the first one is saying x is less than 2. Since it's less than, that means we're going to use a parenthesis, and I'm shading everything to the left of 2. Now my second one, answers that are less than negative 3, I actually already highlighted all of those, so I don't need to do anything else. Okay, this is showing my set of answers. If I was writing this in interval notation, it'd be from negative infinity to 2. Now what if this had been an AND problem? This means that our solutions need to be true for both sets of numbers. So, I'm going to go ahead and draw out my number line. I'm going to do these two separately and shade where they overlap. So our first one, values that are less than 2, would be to the left of 2. Then I need to go ahead and answer my second question, where values that are less than negative 3, that would be to the left of negative 3. Now we can see this is where they overlap, everywhere to the left of negative 3. So on my number line, okay, I'm using a parenthesis again because it's less than, and I'm only shading to the left of negative 3 because these are the only solutions that are true in both of those. So and, we, share where, we shade where it overlaps, and in or, we just shade straight onto the number line. This was the final concept we talked about. Um, so I just want to do an easy example and then a tough one. Okay, first thing, I want to isolate the absolute value. It is already isolated. So I'm going to make two equations. Yes, equations, not the inequalities. I'm taking this expression and I'm setting it equal to the number and setting it equal to its opposite. Now I'm going to go ahead and solve both of these equations. So I end up getting x is equal to 4 and x is equal to 1. And if I substitute these in, okay, if I put 4 in, I get 8 minus 5 is 3. The absolute value of 3 is 3. If I put 1 in, I get 2 minus 5, which is negative 3. The absolute value of negative 3 is also 3. So there are my two different values, and we need to test intervals for shading. 
We said most of the time we either shade on the outside or we shade in between. So let's try a number on the outside. I'm going to try my favorite number, zero. So when I do this, I went ahead and substituted in and I got the absolute value of negative five is less than or equal to three. We need to remember that absolute value is a distance so it becomes positive. Is five less than three? No, it's not. So we know we're not shading to the left. My prediction is that we're going to shade in the middle. So I'm gonna choose a number in the middle here. I chose two. Two times two minus five, I end up getting negative one. The absolute value of negative one is one. One is less than or equal to three, so I know I'm gonna shade in the middle here. Last thing I need to check is to the right. So I chose, I chose to use the number five. Two times five is 10 minus five is five. The absolute value of five is five. Five is not less than or equal to three. So that tells me that my solutions are all in between one and four. I'm using brackets because if we look at our original problem, it said less than or equal to. Last problem I wanna go through, another inequality problem. Um, another absolute value inequality problem, in fact, but our absolute value is not all by itself. I know I cannot add the one and the two because this entire quantity is connected, so these are not like terms. So I went ahead and subtracted one from both sides and I got two times the absolute value of x plus one is greater than four. Then I'm dividing both sides by two to get my absolute value all by itself and I get the absolute value of x plus one is greater than two. So now that it's by itself, I can go ahead and set up my two equations which would be x plus one equals two, x plus one equals negative two. So now I'm going to solve those for my critical point. And I ended up getting negative three and one. So I put those on the number line. I knew negative three had to be to the left. Now I'm gonna test intervals for shading. So I'm gonna to start to the left here. I'm gonna choose negative four. I could substitute into this original inequality. I think that might be a little bit too much work. So I'm gonna substitute into my easier looking one that I simplified. When I substitute that in, it ends up working because I get the absolute value of negative four, which is four, and that makes a true statement because four is greater than two. So I know I'm shading to the left. My prediction is we're also going to shade to the right. So let's try a number in, in the middle just to make sure I didn't make a mistake. So this time I tried zero because that's in between and I get one is greater than two, that is not true, so I'm not going to shade in the middle. Now let's try one to the right. So I get three is greater than two, which is a true statement. So I'm shading to the left, I'm shading to the right, and what this is showing me is that all these solutions are true statements, they are solutions to the inequality. Okay, so this was a quick review. Once again, I didn't cover everything on the test. I just wanted to highlight a few things. Make sure to study your review worksheet, um, study your notes, study your homework assignments, and did I mention study your quizzes? Um, good luck, and I know you guys will do your best. See you in class. Bye.